Okay, uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, fourth session of cases uh, titled Security from Transistors to Compilers. Um, so I'll just make some few quick announcements and then we'll get to the talks. So the first announcement is this session will be recorded. Uh, second is in uh, regarding the time limit. So for the journal track papers, we have 10 minutes of presentation time and five minutes of question answer. And for the work in progress papers, we have three minutes of presentation time and two minutes of question answer. So I request everyone to adhere to the times. Uh, regarding the question answer session, uh, you are highly encouraged to uh, orally ask your questions. So please raise your hands during the question answer session and I will invite you to ask the question. Uh, for those uh, who still prefer uh, typing the question, you may also do that in the chat box. Uh, and I'll read out your question, but I would prefer that you ask it yourself. And uh, the attendees at Shanghai, if you have any questions, you may please approach the local coordinators and uh, ask your questions. So without further ado, let's go to the first talk. So let me introduce the first speaker. Um, the first speaker uh, is Francesco Restuccia. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California at San Diego. He received his PhD in computer engineering from Scuola Superior Santa Ana Pisa in 2021. His main research interests include hardware security and safety, cyber physical systems, and time predictable acceleration of deep neural networks. So um, let's uh, hear the first talk. Uh, I believe it's a recorded one. So Ali may please uh, play the video. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this presentation. I'm in the title Captain Forward Safe and Secure Communication for FPGA System on Chips. I am Francesco Restuccia and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, San Diego. And I've done this work in collaboration with Professor Ryan Kastner, which is also with the University of California, San Diego. Okay, I would like to start uh, giving you an introduction on what's inside the modern heterogeneous system on chip. Basically, what you can find is a set of controllers uh, that are active, uh, uh, and these are like processors, DMAs, hardware accelerators, uh, and access a set of uh, peripherals that are generally shared. And these are memory IOs and other generic peripherals. And th these controllers and peripherals are connected uh, with a system interconnect. In our case, we consider an AXI interconnect is uh, AXI is the de facto standard for communication in heterogeneous platforms, in modern heterogeneous platforms. At the bottom of this slide, you can see how is the architecture implemented in a modern FPGA system on chips. Okay, but what can go wrong? Well, in previous work, we demonstrated that uh, um, a lack of specification in the standard, the XI standard, can leave uh, um, one single hardware model in the system, a single hardware manager, the possibility to affect the availability of uh, all of the resources in the system and create the dangerous conditions such as denial of service of uh, access to the memory. I will invite you to check out the paper for all of the details because I don't have much time to go in these details. But why these condition of stalls are generated? Well, uh, uh, they can be leveraged by misbehaving model to create dangerous conditions uh, threatening the execution of the system but also by misbehaving models that have been uh, not uh, properly developed or tested. But it's also something that happens uh, for optimization, such as uh, in speculative uh, uh, bus access. And um, to provide an example on that, we collected a real wafer track uh, on the exciting uh, deep neural network accelerator, the DPU, uh, implemented on a Zinc Ultrascale Plus platform. This has been collected from the actual execution. And what we can see here is that the DPU itself implements a speculative bus access behavior when it asks for a long transaction for writing data, but it stalled the bus for a long time because it doesn't have the data ready to be written and this creates a condition in the case where the bus is shared with other modules in the system, which is a very common scenario, where the, the access to the memory in writing is uh, prevented from any other uh, module in the system. And so it creates a denial of service of the memory. 
So the impact, uh, it's on security, of course, because it endangers the availability of the shared resources and it's exploitable for the analog service attacks. But also safety, because it creates circular dependencies among controllers and it broke isolation among the controllers. But also on performance, because the performance are lower than expected and there are cycles wasted on data channels. So we investigated the source of this problem and uh, we found that the source of this problem has to be found uh, in the typical switching method implemented in Axa Interconnect for high performance, which is cut through, plus uh, the Axa protocol definition, which uh, states that the write data must be propagated in the same order of the request for transaction. So what happens basically is that uh, in this kind of uh, scenario, the hardware models are trusted to provide quickly all of the data after submitting a request for transactions and leave the bus to the other hardware model in the system. However, this could be leveraged for creating dangerous conditions. There are some solutions available to prevent this issue. The first one is called the access call monitor on the left. Uh, unfortunately, the limitation of this solution is that it requires the application of a worst case analysis, and so it's applicable only to periodic and fully disclosed workloads. There is another classical um, switching methodology called the storing forward that can solve this problem. However, uh, it has high impact on resource and performance. So there are entire classes of applications that are left uncovered, such as best effort and mixed critical applications, but also applications with the area and latency constraints. So we aim to a solution that can be configured uh, on the performance and area impact, and it can also be applicable to any workload. And this solution that we propose is called Cutting Forward, that is a novel switching methodology to be integrated in an AXI interconnect. It is AXI compliant, so it's fully transparent to the network and resources, and it can be implemented inside an interconnect without any uh, required any modification into the uh, other parts of the system. So why should we use Cutting Forward? Because it can combine low latency propagation and low area footprint of cut through with the safe and secure bus communication for any workload of storing forward. That's also why the name Cutting Forward. And it's configurable on a target application through the Cutting Forward parameter C. Very briefly, how Cutting Forward works. Uh, well, uh, it is configured with the parameter C and basically, Cutting Forward itself waits uh, to propagate the request for transaction uh, until it has buffered at least the C data words uh, internally. When the C words have been buffered, the Cutting Forward generates uh, a sub request for C words. So it books uh, actually the bugs only for the C words that have already been buffered. And the buffered C words uh, are propagated without any stall. And in parallel with the propagation, uh, the following words provided by the model can the other model can be buffered internally. So it creates a condition of the pipelining between data validation and data propagation. Also, there is uh, uh, the B responses are merged to be compliant with the AXI standard. I invite you to check out the paper for the full details because I don't have much time here to go in deep detail. So uh, what's good of, uh, of Cut and Forward is that uh, Cut and Forward is safe and secure because the burden of completing transaction is removed from the manager is given to the Cut and Forward buffer. We know what's inside, so we trust the Cut and Forward buffer. And the managers cannot ever stall the bus. There is a cap also in introduced on the uh, maximum buffering latency for uh, uh, data validation is a cycle of cycle is independent on the bus length of the transaction. Also, Cut and Forward is um, prone to scale because any manager interface has its private cut and forward buffer, so multiple stalls are naturally contained in parallel. We made a full comparison on cut and forward with the state of the art, and basically uh, all of the results are on the paper. We found that uh, besides the, config the configurability and predictability of cut and forward, which got also go other good features, which is we don't need uh, to know the workload of the application, and also we don't need to apply any worst case analysis to use cut and forward. You are my guessing now, how do we configure Cut and Forward? So we find the, va the value for the parameter C. We propose a, a further analysis on that for targeting the requirements of an application. As input, we got the error constraint of the application and the maximum response time per transaction. We note that the chunking operated by Cut and Forward may slightly impact the average performance of the system. We consider this effect also in our analysis to uh, reduce the impact on average, on average performance, and we saw in the experiments that anyway is limited. Um, it's also worth noting that the application of the our analysis is not mandatory. The designer may use other methodologies to set the parameters C according to the requirements of the system. 
Okay, for the experimental validation, we uh, checked the different uh, realistic uh, architectures uh, deployed in two uh, modern platforms. And basically, we implemented a cut and forward buffer with the uh, cut through and straight forward into the Axe HyperConnect, which is a research interconnect we developed in the past. And uh, at first, we wanted to check uh, that uh, the latency per transaction was independent on the vast length of the transaction and uh, also configurable on the parameter C. And that's uh, what happened, wh what you can see from the first chart at the top. In the middle, we evaluated the worst case impact on write access time with respect to cut through, and we saw that it's pretty limited, 3% and 7% with respect to 90% uh, uh, of the story forward for the two configurations that and forward tested. And also we checked the impact uh, on uh, um, average performances. Uh, we've seen that uh, uh, it's maximum 8% with respect to cut through, but it depends on C, it can be also lower. Uh, briefly, research consumption, we have seen, uh, we investigated them and we've seen that their impact on cut and forward is also configurable through the parameter C. And also at the end, uh, we created a realistic mispatical application scenario with uh, uh, Axilinx HIDN accelerator for deep neural network acceleration, a critical sensor that uh, must uh, um, uh, execute within a deadline, and a generic high performance DMA model that introduces tools in the system. So what we want from this scenario is minimum FPS for the HIDN and strict execution deadline for the critical sensor. And what you can see in the first chart on the left uh, is that uh, whenever we use path through and uh, we activate the, DA, the DMA model to generate stall, the performance requirements are broken a priori because the access to the memory is uh, uh, prevented. There is a denial of service on the memory, and so uh, none of the hardware models in the system can execute correctly. However, when we introduce cut and forward, we can see that. Uh, even when there is a stall in the system, well, uh, uh, we can keep uh, the system operational. And uh, the bottom line is that with a limited impact of performance uh, from four to 6% with respect to cut through, we can introduce a safe and secure bus access and prevent uh, the execution of the system to be jeopardized uh, in the presence of misbehaving or malicious uh, models. Here is the summary of uh, what we've been talking about uh, in this presentation. I would like uh, to thank all of you for your attention and I welcome all of your questions. I thought, oh, that was a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, so is the speaker available to take questions? It appears not. Ali, can you confirm? Okay, he just uh, sent me an email that he was not able to connect to Zoom. It seems that he has a network connection okay. problem. Okay. All right, so we'll uh, stick to the schedule. So in about uh, two minutes, we can start the next uh, uh, talk, which is also a recorded talk. So, Ali, you can be ready. So, yeah, everyone, the speaker is not available uh, to take questions because of some technical difficulties. So, we will be moving on to the next talk. Uh, so our next speaker is Priyanka Panigrahi. Uh, so, Priyanka is currently pursuing her PhD in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Guwahati, India. Her research interests include compiler security, embedded software, and security verification. She has won the Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship India 2022. She's a student member of IEEE. So um, we welcome Priyanka to present. Uh, I believe it's a recorded talk. So Ali, uh, please uh, begin the video. Thank you. Hello, I'm Priyanka Banigrahi from Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Guwahati, India. Today I'm going to present our paper, Quantifying Information Leakage for Security Verification of Compiler Optimizations. This is the outline of our presentation. First, I'll introduce you to Compiler. Compiler converts a source program into a target program after applying a set of optimizations to improve the performance of the code. However, a compiler optimization can be functionally correct but not secure. Consider this motivational example of dead store elimination. So in this example, program S reads a password, uses it, and later it is cleared from the memory. However, when compiler applies optimization, it will consider the statement x equal to 0 as a dead store, and it will remove it and generate program T. If you analyze the security, now the password 
is leaking in through variable x in t, which is not there in x. Thus, DSC is functionally correct but not secure. So, from this motivational example, you can conclude that a compiler cannot be trusted as it does not preserve the source level security. We found in the literature that exist methods to secure a specific optimization like uh, dead store elimination, single static assignment, and also we proposed a secure register allocation in LLVM framework. We also found that in the literature there are methods exist for secure compilation. However, there is not much study on security vulnerability due to compiler optimization. And also making individual optimization secure is not the solution since compiler applies hundreds of optimization. We also found that in the literature there is no method exist which considers all the optimization techniques as a single unit and validate the security between the source and transform program. In the literature, there is a primary method to quantify the leakage in a program that is taint analysis. Taint analysis basically extracts the dependency chains between a vulnerable statement and its source of vulnerability. Consider this example in which variable h is a tainted or sensitive type and all other variables are non-sensitive type. So in this code motion, the statements B and C is moved inside the conditional block. The first problem with taint analysis is under tainting. Under tainting completely ignores the implicit flaws. Implicit flaws. So this causes false negative because the variable C is leaking the high input edge, but under tainting cannot capture this. The next problem with taint analysis is over tainting. Over tainting taints all the variables defined inside a tainted condition. So this cause false positive because B is not leaking any information about H. So the issue with taint analysis is it either under approximates or over approximates the leak due to the implicit information flow. Therefore, we need a precise analysis of implicit flows in control block. A uh, taint analysis is also performed on loops. Consider this example of loop. Here, the password is a sensitive information. In the first iteration, variable A is leaking password. In the second iteration, variable B is also leaking password. However, there is no other possible leak in further iterations. Thus, this is what we are calling, a, uh, we need fixed point of information leakage for loop. We found that in the literature there is no method exist which handles multiple paths inside loop and also there is no method exist which considers the implicit leak due to a loop. In our problem we consider input variables are either of high security type or low security type. High security implies sensitive information and low security implies non-sensitive information and program variables are always of low security type. In a threat model, we assume that attacker has always uh, access to the executable code but not the secret data. And the attacker's goal is to get information about this secret data. Our problem statement is quantification of information leakage in a program for compiler optimizations. So our first objective is to develop a sound approach for quantification of information leakage in a program which will reduce the over approximation of implicit leaks in the context of compiler optimizations. So for, a, uh, for the method of quantification, we need a leak propagation vector to measure the leak in a program. We need to analyze the implicit leak precisely and uh, we also need an approach to find the fixed point for loops. And then finally, we need a scalable method which will find the overall leak in a program. So we proposed a leak propagation vector which measure the leak in a program. So the leak propagation vector is represented as delta m where m is the program and it has two elements. The first element c is an x bit integer where x is the number of high inputs. So the first element C represents the leak of high input due to the condition of a branch. So whenever there is an influence of high input in a condition, the corresponding bit is set to 1. The second integer, the second element is a set of integers n1 to nk for each variable uh, where each 
integer is of x bit and uh, which represents the leak of uh, high input through a variable. Now we'll see how do we handle the implicit leak. So to uh, measure the implicit leak, we find the culprit block in which the condition has a direct or indirect influence of high inputs. To measure the implicit leak, our basic intuition is to analyze only this culprit blocks in a blockwise manner. And if a variable is defined in the same way in all the parallel paths in the conditional block, then it has no implicit leak. And also, if a variable in the culprit block is redefined later, then also it has no implicit leak. I'll explain this with an example. Consider this example. Here, the conditional block is culprit because the condition is influenced by the high input password. And the variable uh, v has different symbolic values in the parallel paths. And assume there is no redefinition of variable b, v, then we are saying that v is leaking password. This is how we handle the implicit leak precisely. Our leak vector is also used to find the fixed point of loop. Consider this example of loop again. And uh, here we have a single high input. Thus, each integer is of one bit. In the first iteration, if we find the leak, A is leaking password. Thus, so the corresponding bit is set to 1. In the second iteration, B is also leaking password. So the corresponding bit is set to 1. And uh, if we find, uh, if we iterate it further, then we, we, we can see that there is no further leak. So this we are saying that we reach the fixed point of the loop. Our leak vector is also used to handle multiple paths inside a loop. So basically, we find the uh, leak of each branch inside a a loop to find the fixed point. This is the abstract algorithm to find the overall leak in the program. So we start from the start step and for each path emanating from the start state, we check whether that step is a loop state or not. If it is a loop state, we find the loop leak. Otherwise, we find the explicit leak and we further check whether the state is a branching state or not. If it is a branching branching state, we further check whether it is a culprit branch or not. If it is a culprit branch, then we find the implicit leak. After finding the overall leak in the path, we check whether there is further propagation of leak to the subsequent path or not. If there is a possible propagation of leak to the subsequent path, we call the find leak function recursively. This is how we find the overall leak in the program. So this represents the function call graph of the proposed approach to quantify the information leakage in the program. Finally, we propose three quantification parameters in terms of our leak vector. The first parameter is to find the total number of leaky high inputs in a program. I'll explain this with an example. Consider this example. Uh, here, delta m represents the leak of uh, a program m. Uh, and to identify to find the uh, parameter one, if we if we make a union of uh, each column, we'll get the leak of each high input. If we continue this for each column, we'll get all such bits. And if we sum up all these bits, then we'll get the first parameter. Now our second parameter is to find the number of unique leaky variables in a program. So to find out this, uh, if we make a union of uh, each row, we'll get a bit which represents the leak of a specific uh, variable and if we continue this for each row we'll get all such bits and if we sum up all these bits we'll get the uh, second parameter our final parameter is to find the total number of leaky variables with respect to unique high input in a program so to find this we just need to sum up all these bits in the leak vector so our goal is to use these quantifying parameters for the translation validation of security verification. In our experiment, we have considered different set of high inputs for each benchmark. 
Then we measured the explicit leak and implicit leak for each such case. Uh, finally, we found that uh, for 15 out of 20 cases, the transform program is not relatively secure to the source program, which confirms that compiler optimization is not secure. We have also measured the unique leaky variables and uh, total leaky variables for a uh, source program versus the transform program. And we found that unique leaky variables and also the leaky variables are more in the transform program for most of the benchmarks. We have also compared our approach with under-tending and over-tending. And we found that our approach ignored the false positives due to over-tending. The linear plot here in this graph uh, signifies that the implementation overhead is linear in our case. Finally, to summarize our presentation, we found that existing security measurement methods are not applicable in the context of compiler optimizations. Therefore, we have developed a sound method for quantification of information leakage in a program, which can be adapted for any general purpose compiler. These are some of the selected references. Thank you. Okay, that was another very interesting talk. Uh, uh, thank you, Priyanka. And I believe Priyanka is available to take questions. So uh, anyone in the audience wishes to ask a question? Okay, I believe someone at uh, uh, Shanghai wishes to ask a question. Hello. Ricky, can you hear me? Yeah, I yes, found the uh, host one who uh, is being mute. We uh, in person, uh, uh, audience have questions. Yeah. Please, please. Here, I think you can hear. Yeah. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, quick question. So, yes. my question yes. is: yes. Is your okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. So my question is: Is the approach cares about the uh, the source or the cause of the leakage? For example, if there is no leakage in the source code, but there is the leakage after the compiling, is the approach consider about this situation? Um, are you willing to? Uh, are you available to answer? Questions? Hello, actually, I'm not able to get the question. Can anyone please repeat? Uh, so, uh, I, if I got it, out? yes, please. Okay, so my question is Is your approach consider about the, the source of the leakage? For example, is it possible that the source code has no leakage, has no uh, information or privacy leakage, but after compiling the executable? Uh, code has the leakage. Do you consider about this situation? Uh, uh, no, no, actually. We are checking the relative security here. So we are checking whether the transform program has introduced any new leak uh, in other. Actually, here we are not checking the uh, leaks in the source program. Whether we are only checking whether the transform has generated any new leak uh, uh, other than the source. It may be possible that the source is not secure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope it answers. Yeah, that answers perfectly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe we can take further questions later on in the poster session because now it's time for the next talk. So uh, mm. yeah. let, let's move on to the next uh, speaker. Let me introduce the next speaker quickly. Um, so next speaker is uh, Nikhil Rangarajan, uh, who is a senior engineer in the NAND division at Micron Semiconductor Singapore. Prior to this, he was a postdoctoral associate at the Division of Engineering, New York University, Abu Dhabi. He has PhD and MS degrees in electrical engineering from New York University and a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from uh, the National Institute of Technology, Trichy, India. His research interests include spintronics, nanoelectronics, device physics, and hardware security. His past work has explored the security implications of non-conventional computing paradigms born out of emerging devices. So uh, I believe the presentation is going to be done by Johan. Uh, so we invite Johan to please take over. So yeah, actually uh, we are also using the recording. Um, 
So I'm here okay. on the cut off to take the questions, but let's use the recording, please. Okay, so uh, Ali, you may play the recording and uh, Johan's willing to take the questions at the end. Thanks, yeah. Hello, I'm Dr. Nikhil Rangarajan, and today I'm going to talk about our work, a novel attack mode on advanced technology nodes exploiting transistor self-heating. This was a collaborative work between the Center for Cybersecurity at NYU Abu Dhabi and the Chair for Semiconductor Test and Reliability at the University of Stuttgart. So let's dive in. The outline of this presentation is as follows. Firstly, I'll briefly talk about the background associated with self-heating and related phenomena in scale transistor topologies. Then I'll delve into the concepts of hardware security vulnerabilities and the threat landscape that self-heating introduces in modern ICs. After that, I'll discuss the methodology for leveraging self-heating to design the proposed Trojan payload. Next, we'll take a look at the evaluation of the proposed Trojan in the form of some case studies and use scenarios. And finally, I'll conclude with a summary of all that has been presented in the talk. So first, let us talk about the origin of self-heating and how it manifests in FinFETs. Self-heating is caused by a combination of factors, notably the limited silicon volume for heat dissipation in confined transistor geometries and the low thermal conductivity of high K gate oxides. As you can see in the top figure here, planar transistors have a larger volume and hence many paths for the heat to dissipate. However, for the FinFET in the bottom figure, the heat dissipation volume is quite limited due to the fin structure and the gate all around topology. The primary mechanism responsible for generating this heat in the first place is the carrier phonon interaction in the channel, as seen here. The thermal profile of a FinFET due to self-heating looks something like this. As you can see, there is a considerable increase in the temperature of the channel due to the confined channel geometry, especially near the drain to channel junction where exaggerated electric fields are prevalent. Okay, so how do we model the self-heating that occurs in advanced FinFET nodes? To do this, we use the industry standard compact models in Beeson CMG, and we specifically utilize the parameters for the channel thermal resistance and thermal capacitance that are calibrated with values extracted from measurements using these equations. The values for various parameters in these equations are obtained from 7 nanometer data provided by IMEC as shown in this table. Now let us take a look at how the self-heating effect depends on the FinFIT parameters like fin number and contact type. This figure over here shows that the channel temperature increase due to self-heating is exacerbated by increasing the number of fins in the fin set. Also, tuning the contact resistance between the drain side semiconductor and the metal contact is another knob to control the thermal resistance because it directly impacts the ability of the transistor to dissipate the self-heating induced heat. This is shown using Synopsis and Taurus TCAT tool flows in the figure on the right here. Now, having seen what causes self-heating, let us take a look at what effects it has in FinFETs. Bias temperature instability and hot carrier injection are major aging mechanisms that are responsible for degrading transistor reliability in advanced nodes. And these mechanisms are stimulated and accelerated by the elevated temperatures caused by self-heating. Bias temperature instability and hot carrier injection occur due to the vertical and horizontal electric fields respectively, wherein the silicon hydrogen bonds at the interfacial layer are broken down due to the induced stress or due to the injected high energy carriers. This causes interface traps and oxide traps to accumulate over time, which increases the threshold voltage and reduces the carrier mobility due to Coulomb scattering. Here, we can see the progression of aging induced threshold voltage increase with and without self-heating effects. Moving on to the concept part of the presentation, let us now analyze the security vulnerabilities arising from self-heating induced change in FinFET electrical characteristics like the threshold voltage. Firstly, a threshold voltage change in the IC post-deployment can enable data or key-stealing attacks. It can very obviously aid denial of service attacks. Further, it can provide opportunities for launching fault injection attacks and also promote unwanted side-channel leakage in the IC as well. The threat landscape for a modern IC looks something like this, with various types of attacks perpetrated from various locations with a wide range of end goals. In this work, we specifically consider a foundry-based attacker 
who inserts the proposed hardware trojan into the IC during fabrication for enacting any of the scenarios listed on the left. So our threat model assumes a supply chain with an untrusted foundry shown here in red with all the other entities considered trusted. Now let us look at the methodology to design the proposed self-heating based trojan payload. The payload is realized using threshold voltage dependent reconfigurable gates like these, which implement different functionalities depending on the threshold voltage of their individual transistors. In this example, the payload gate is capable of reconfiguring from an AND to OR gate through the self-heating induced threshold voltage increase. The required levels of threshold voltage shifts for this reconfiguration are highlighted in the table below and the corresponding functional waveforms from SPI simulations are shown here. We note here that other functional reconfigurations apart from AND to OR are also possible by modulating the transistor threshold voltages, but they may require a different set of circuit structures than the one presented over here. From the previous slide, we have seen that the proposed hardware trojan requires two levels, that is plus 40 millivolts and plus 80 millivolts of self-heating assisted delta VTH rise for different transistors of the payload gate. Further, for a foundry-based attacker to be able to clearly define a trigger time, after which the payload gate is activated with a high probability, the time taken for achieving these two levels of delta VTH must coincide. This can be realized by properly tuning the individual transistor parameters like doping, extension region length, and contact resistance during the design time. By setting the appropriate thermal resistance for the two different transistor flavors, we can ensure that they achieve plus 40 millivolts and plus 80 millivolts delta VTH respectively at the same time. In this figure, we show how different trigger times ranging from 3.8 months to 3 years can be obtained by using different combinations of thermal resistance values for the different payload transistors. Moving on to the evaluation part, we now demonstrate some attack vectors using the proposed trojan and their corresponding results. The first one being a chosen plain text attack on a 128-bit pipeline AES implementation to steal the secret key. Here, the reconfigurable payload is inserted before the 10th round to cause a stuck at one fault as shown in this figure. Then, the attacker can use the simple algorithm to recover all the 128 bits of the AES encryption key. To visually represent this attack, we encrypt a sample image with 128-bit AES, where the encrypted image is shown on the left here, and then deduce the secret key using the above chosen plain text attack. The obtained key is then used to decrypt the encrypted image and obtain the plain text image shown here on the right. For this attack, we quantify the area and power overheads of the payload and its peripherals in this table, and we find that they are quite nominal. Next, we demonstrate denial of service in an image processing IP, that is, we cause output corruption in a Gaussian blur filter. To construct the Gaussian blur filter, we use a 32-bit floating point multiplier, and we embed the payload in this multiplier, since a corrupted multiplier output produces a large deviation from the expected output image. The image on the left is the original input image, which has to undergo Gaussian blur filtering. The image in the center is the expected output, whereas the image on the right is what we actually obtain from the infected IC. Here, the computation of each pixel is done via the corrupted multiplier, and hence the output image is distorted with a non-uniform contrast rather than displaying a variation in the degree of Gaussian blurring. Now, let's discuss about some possible countermeasures that might be employed against the proposed self-heating based trojan and how they can be circumvented. Firstly, there are optical inspection and image processing based detection techniques which are generic to any type of hardware trojan. An example is shown here on the right. These can be quite effective, but they are cost and time intensive for larger samples. They often require destruction of the IC sample which makes them impractical. And further, the untrusted foundry can simply utilize different masks for the original and infected designs for different IC batches. Then, there are neural network and machine learning based trojan detection methods. However, they assume that it is possible to obtain an IC instance with the trojan already triggered. This can be invalidated by designing a trojan with a larger trigger time sufficiently into the future. There are also statistical power analysis based techniques which can pick up on anomalies in the power traces of the infected IC if the power overheads of the trojan are significant. But here again, Traditional techniques like statistical test pattern generation and excitation of rare logic conditions at internal nodes are countered by setting a longer trigger time. Finally, one can attempt to scale the supply voltage to slow down the self-heating induced aging effects in the payload transistors in order to push back the trigger time. But this will negatively impact the IC performance. Finally, 
Let me briefly summarize my talk today. So we saw that self-heating is exacerbated in advanced FinFET nodes due to the confined geometry and limited volume for heat dissipation. And this heat accelerates aging effects and changes transistor electrical characteristics like the threshold voltage. Then we saw that self-heating induced threshold voltage change can be controlled by a foundry-based attacker by tuning parameters like doping, contact resistance, and extension region length. And hence, a threshold voltage dependent reconfigurable payload gate like this can be realized. And lastly, we saw that the reconfigurable payload gate can enable a variety of attack vectors like key stealing and denial of service. With that, we come to the end of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Oh, that was another fascinating talk. Uh, so I believe we have Johan here to take questions. So anyone uh, who would like to ask a question? Yes, is there someone asking a question? Yes. Is there someone at Shanghai, I believe? Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll ask a, a quick question, Johan. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. Shanghai Venue. I think Shanghai Venue has questions. Okay, um, okay. Let, let's take a question from Shanghai. Um, I saw some pictures of the simulation of the heat uh, pictures. Uh, I, I want to know with what software is uh, also used in this paper to do this uh, simulation of this heat uh, simulation. Yes, thank you. All right, so this is based on a multi-physics simulation using commercial tools and the Synopsys Centaurus in particular. Okay, thank you. And uh, the technology is basically for an advanced node and then also fed by measurement data from other collaborators like IMIC. So we try to be as realistic as possible for even these advanced geometries. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Is there any other question? I have a question. Uh, I see uh, um, advanced uh, telemetry nodes. And uh, I want to know if uh, you try the other uh, dynamic, uh, like you uh, put on thin fat. Uh, I want to know if it, your method can uh, work uh, that um, other uh, technology nodes. Okay, so if I understand the question, you're asking if the uh, idea of this uh, self-heating trojan will also work for different technologies, correct? This is my understanding. And uh, yes, it will work. So in the paper, for example, we've also shown some examples how self-heating will be an issue with nanowire geometries. So we have FinFET geometries as well as nanowires, which are somewhat similar, if you will, but still quite different in the low-level geometries. So I think the general answer would be, uh, yes, for advanced technologies, it will be an issue. For older technologies, not so much. Um, but in the end of the day, what we're looking at is um, aging-induced changes in the threshold voltage. So it doesn't have to be even heating. It could be any other mechanism as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's all the time we have for questions now. But I encourage the audience you know, to uh, meet up with Johan later on, maybe at the poster session, and ask further questions. So I'll quickly go over to the next speaker. So thank you, Johan. Thanks. Okay, uh, so our next speaker is Yinan Chen, uh, who has received his BS degree from National University of Defense Technology, Changsha, China in 2014. He's currently pursuing the MS degree in the School of Electronic Information and Electrical Engineering, Shanghai Jiaotong University, Shanghai, China. His research interests include cyber attack, network security, and Internet of Things. So over to you, Yinan, you may start your talk. So this is a work in progress talk. Uh, you have three minutes time. Hello, distinguished chairman and professors. My paper is divided into six parts. 
The first pass is backgrounds and motivation. The SCADA may be exported to cyber attack threats such as unauthorized internal access, DDoS attack, then in the middle attack, and the vapor attack. We proper a three lawyer ideas, IDS defense systems for power system SCADA networks. The first layer is access control, which must realize the separation of data and control. The, SD, the SDN service helps us achieve the objective. The purpose, the purpose of second layer ideas is to detect for to prevent the DDoS access. We need to develop the for detection soft, software to identify the four events, which are divided into three kinds, normal, normal events and the DDoS attacks. The third lawyer of ideas must solve the problem that SCADA may suffer the main in the middle attack and the, the rapper attack. We proper uh, end-to-end uh, Encryption method, which is based on a hardware module called the SDTU. The three lawyer IDS model integrates the access code control for detections and the password authentication functions. The whole IDS works together, and there is no single point files problem. We take a reliable test system, IEEE RTS 17.9 as an example. We assure six scenarios to verify the experiment. We can obtain a conclusion that in case of cyber attacks, the three lawyer IDS model has the best reliability. In future research, more cyber attacks centers in on cyber SCADA in power systems will be analyzed. A more comprehensive SCADA reliability evaluation model will be obtained. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yana. Uh, are there any questions? Yana is here to answer any questions. Anybody at Shanghai? Anybody online? Uh, so maybe I'll ask one quick question, Yenan. Uh, how did you evaluate all of this? Is it an actual setting or is it a simulation? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I can't hear you. Ah, yeah. how, how did you evaluate? Is it by simulation or, or is it an actual system? Oh. You had we some evaluations, a, some graphs. Uh, we take the reliable test system, uh, IEEE RTS 17.9 as an example. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, it appears no, so thank you, Yanan. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, yeah, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any names. Uh, so the next speaker is Xiao Hang Wang, who has received uh, the B Engineering and PhD degrees in Communication and Electronic Engineering from Zhejiang University in 26, uh, 20, 2006 and 2011, respectively. He's currently a professor at Zhejiang University, recipient of the PDP 2015 and BLSI SOC 2014 Best Paper Awards. He was a special session chair of NOX 2018, steering committee of NOCAC 2014 to 2018, and TPC chair of ICCS 2021. He also served as a guest editor of the Mathematics Journal and Microelectronics Journal. His research interests include many core architecture, power efficient architectures, optimal control, and NOC based systems. So over to you, uh, Xiaohang. 
Okay, thank you for a nice introduction. Can you uh, see my screen share? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, the topic is the evaluation of the on chip uh, thermal cover channel attacks. And this is the outline. And in this work, uh, we will evaluate the impact of different line coding and modulation methods uh, on the thermal cover channel attacks. Uh, specifically, we will uh, evaluate the bit error rate and the throughput of the thermal cover channel uh, attacks. And this is the uh, this is the broke bro diagram of the thermal cover channel attack. And in this work, we will change uh, we we will evaluate the different line coding and the modulation schemes. And um, for the line codings, we will choose. Uh, return to zero code, uh, which is short for RZ code, and also the Manchester code. And for the um, RZ code, um, it has to hit for a time of um, gamma, and then it will need to cool down uh, to the original temperature inside a symbol length. And for the Manchester code, we will use a, um, a uh, classifier to decode the signal. And for the modulation methods, uh, for the ASK, we will use the amplitude of the temperature to encode the bit one and zero. And for FSK, we will use the frequency uh, to encode uh, the um, one and zero. And also with uh, PWM, we will first modulate the signal into ASK and then um, to modulate it into a pulse wave to form the PWM signals. So this is the uh, experimental um, results. We do every experimental result. Uh, we, we perform all the experiments on a real machine and uh, we try the different combinations of the thermal cover channel attacks uh, scenarios. So this is like a uh, design space exploration. So here uh, we evaluated the 13 different scenarios. And here we have some preliminary results. So from this figure, uh, when the just mission rate is 100 BPS, the BARO scheme four is lower than uh, 10%. And also from this table, uh, it showed that the band path, which means a higher frequency um, schemes, has a lower BR compared to those of the um, baseband schemes. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? I do have a question. Okay. Yes, yes. So in your study, um, what assumptions do you make for the uh, um, accuracy of the sensors? Like, do you rely on uh, commercial products or do you just keep it generic? Uh, we will use, uh, in this experiment, we use the commercial ones. Uh, so the uh, resolution is about one uh, degree. Mm -hmm. One degree only. Okay, that's okay. I thought yeah. the sensors would be already offering higher resolution. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. Uh, are there any other questions uh, before I move on? No, I, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, Jawang. Thanks. I'll move on to our last. I'll move on to our last speaker. Uh, who I think is at the venue. So let me quickly introduce the speaker. So our last speaker is Sheng Chen, who has received the BE degree in integrated circuit design and integrated system from Shandong University, Jinan, China in 2021. He's currently pursuing the ME degree in information and communication engineering with Shandong University, Qingdao, China. His current research interests include lightweight cryptography, cryptographic hardware and communication security. So over to you. Uh, yes, can, I, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you fine. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Cheng Chen from Shandong University in China. I represent all the authors of the article and introduce our work briefly. Today, our topic is towards a smaller than green stream site optimized FPG implication of fruit eating. Driven by the development of IoT, a large number of embedded devices have been applied in real life, however, Due to resources constraint in IoT, for example, power and uh, computation resources, most standard encryption algorithm cannot be directly used. So we should find effective implementations of lightweight ciphers. In our paper, we choose Fruit 80 stream cipher because it has some attractive features, small size and high security level. It is very promising in IoT applications. We propose two architectures for different performance requirements. The first one is the area optimization architecture. We integrated the update logic of different stages of root 80 into functions and used multiplexers to implement multiple branches. Besides, we use Shift register lookup table to optimize the feedback shift register in Fruit 80 to save resources. It's worth noting that we should guarantee the ratio of lookup table and flip block to meet the requirements of configurable logic blocks in FPGA. The second one is the speed optimization architecture. The general parallelization strategy is duplicating the feedback functions. However, it will lead high latency because of the reuse of feedback structure. So we propose a hybrid strategy to separate the future function from the feedback logic before producing keystream or cipher core updates in serial. After this, the feedback <laughs> function updates many rounds in one clock. <laughs> Finally, we come to the results. Our area optimization architecture only requires 35 slices on three serious FPGA in settings. Nine slices smaller than that of green. But for the speed optimization architecture, our design can reach 7.74 million bits per second. It's more than green version 1, 16. That's all of my speech. And uh, any questions? Hi, uh, thank you. So any questions? Anyone online? Anyone at Shanghai? Uh, yes, there is a question in the audience. Okay, I have a quick question. Uh, can you reply uh, why do you use the uh, 18 bit? Uh, 18 bit. 18. I put the 18 bit. Okay. And I see that uh, in your experiment, uh, you compared with the 128, right? Uh, yes. So why why do you close the uh, uh, first of all, the Fruit 80 stream cipher has uh, <laughs> some advantages just to show as the screen. Uh, first of all, it has a small size of internal space, and uh, uh, we can see the number is 87. Uh, in general, we compare different uh, cipher implementation in the same in the same internal state. Uh, but we compare it with the uh, green 128 because the green 128 cipher is uh, has more has much through output in theory. Yeah. If uh, our implementations can reach more through output than green 128, uh, it can prove that our <laughs> implementation methods are effective and it can be extended to 
the more cyclists. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, all right. So um, thank you, Sheng Chen, and uh, thank you, everyone. So that was the uh, last speaker in this session. Uh, it was a very, very interesting session. Uh, I encourage uh, everyone, the speakers as well as the audience, to please attend the poster sessions at the Bund, uh, where you can meet the authors and ask for the questions. So uh, thank you, everyone, for attending Cases 4. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you.